War of the Worlds starring Tom Cruise, although being based on the novel by H.G. Wells, also takes many elements that are specifically from the 1953 film adaptation. Let's get the obvious one out of the way, so immediately major spoilers for these films. At the end of the 2005 War of the Worlds, Ray finally arrives at his ex-wife's parents' house, and his ex-wife's parents are played by Jean Barry and Anne Robinson, who were the lead actors in the 1953 version, respectively playing Dr. Clayton Forrester and Sylvia Van Buren. Indeed, The War of the Worlds was Gene Barry's second film, and War of the Worlds was his final film, which is quite fitting that his career was bookended, if you pardon the pun, by these two films, considering, as he said, when people think back on my career, that is what they talk about. They talk about War of the Worlds. Earlier on in the film, when the first tripod rises, there's actually a reference to the latter of those characters, with a sign behind Tom Cruise revealing it takes place around Van Buren Street. Although it's worth pointing out that there is a real place in New York called Van Buren Street, but it's still a four hour walk away from Ray's house next to the Bayonne Bridge, and I don't think Rachel and Robbie were waiting for four hours while Ray ran the whole way back did that in one take. So I'm guessing it was an intentional reference, and not just happened to be the name of the street they filmed near. Indeed, Spielberg is very intentional when it comes to street signs. When the tripod is beginning to emerge from its hole, utterly causing a ton of damage on the street, throwing cars about and all that, during this scene, Spielberg purposefully pans over a sign saying, no littering, fine, $1,000. By the way, if you find this kind of thing interesting, press the like button, as that tells YouTube to recommend you more of these kinds of videos. Speaking of the tripods though, I've mentioned this in a previous video, but the shape of them was clearly inspired by the war machines from its predecessor, essentially being an elongated version of that very specific manta ray shape. That being said, it's a pretty minor similarity, and of course the tripods of the Spielberg film are clearly vastly different and original in most other ways. However, Spielberg did actually pay homage to the 1953 War Machines by having one appear in his 2018 film Ready Player One. Seeing this shot makes me interested in seeing a full proper film featuring this style of modern war machine, just out of curiosity of what it'd look like. Both adaptations machines also have the same effect whenever they enter a town, as shown by the 2005 film reusing a line of dialogue that originates from the 1953 version. In the latter, the general says of the war machines, once they begin to move, no more news comes out of that area, while the news reporter in the remake tweaks it slightly, saying, once the tripods start to move, no more news comes out of that area. Once they begin to move, no more news comes out of that area. Once the tripods start to move, no more news comes out of that area. Which is really such a fantastic and chilling line. Indeed, George Powell's 1953 adaptation really defined a new type of War of the Worlds, I'd say, in terms of it set certain precedents of what a War of the Worlds film is that originate with it. Which is shown by the fact, I suppose it could be argued, that the 2005 film is as much a remake of the 1953 version as it is an adaptation of the novel, perhaps even more so. This is possibly never more blatant than in the bits of both films in which the protagonists are trapped in a house surrounded by the machines. Several key scenes happen during these parts, which happen in nearly exactly the same sequence in both versions. The protagonists look out the window and see the machine, then a camera probe arrives, they manage to successfully evade it, then they see the aliens, then the female protagonist turns around and screams as she sees the camera probe has arrived again, to which the male protagonist grabs an axe and cuts it down. Another clear reference there, by the way, is uh, the fact that in both films the female lead screams all the time in a really annoying manner. The only slight difference between these two sequences is the fact that in the 1953 version, the alien actually enters the house immediately after the probe's head gets chopped off, whereas this happens before that in the remake. 
but even the cinematography of this sequence is clearly inspired by the original, as shown by the way the viewer first realises the aliens are entering the vicinity via seeing its shadow cast on the wall. Plus, in both films, what the aliens look like is left as a surprise for at least halfway through the film, which is completely unfaithful to the novel, where they're the first thing that's seen of the invaders. Yet, I think the mystery aspect kind of works probably better for the motion picture format, I would say, so it makes a lot of sense that the 2005 version copied that when filming. And of course, I ought to mention that the camera probe itself is very obviously based specifically on the original film, as opposed to the book's equivalent of this sequence where it's a tentacle that comes down and searches about. This is not the only scene in the 2005 version which is directly taken from the 1953 edition. The scene where Ray gets hijacked and his vehicle taken by a mob is based on the first film as well, where the same thing happens to Forrester. Of course, the main difference here is that Dr. Forrester's vehicle was carrying immensely important and useful stuff, while Ray's car was carrying Rachel. There is kind of an equivalent in the book, but again, it's clearly specifically based on the film. Also, this might be me stretching, but I've always taken Forrester wearing this leather jacket from this scene to the end of the film, as having inspired Tom Cruise's outfit consisting of a leather jacket in the remake. I have a vague memory as a child of them saying this in a documentary, I could be completely misremembering, I'm not sure. Another maybe reference is the fact that when the power goes off, Ray confusedly taps his watch in a very similar manner to Father Parson. Wait, what's his name? Reverend Matthew. Where the heck did I get Father Parson from? Anyway, he does basically the same thing when the power likewise goes off in the 1953 version. A far more obvious homage, however, is in the final scene of the alien invasion, where their machines crash down into buildings and they begin to die. A crowd, including the protagonist, gathers around one of the downed examples, on which a hatch opens up to reveal one of the alien's hands creeping along the ramp before dying, to which a character goes up to it and confirms that it's dead. In the original film, it's Forrester himself who does this, although in the original script for it, it was just a random doctor. Well, in the remake, it's a random soldier. It's quite evident that he is a random soldier and not a random doctor, as he seems to be a really poor judge of knowing when an enemy is dead and no longer a threat. He says it's clear, but then it pans up to show the alien clearly still very alive and like roaring as if it's about to attack or something, before then immediately dying. I also prefer how the original doesn't do this, not actually showing the whole of the alien creature so the audience only sees the arm. It makes it vastly more enigmatic and is a massive reason why it's such an iconic scene and an iconic image, I think. Which is surely why they decided to remake it so precisely in the 2005 version. Which is quite nice to be fair. I really like how, although the design of the aliens is drastically different between the films, their arms are extremely similar, which I've always assumed was just so they could replicate this scene. They probably said to the designers, okay, you can do whatever you like with the aliens, so long as the hands are basically exactly the same, because we need to do that iconic bit at the end. This is shown further by the fact that the theatrical release poster for the 2005 movie likewise utilises a giant version of this same hand grasping out at the earth which is exactly what the theatrical release poster for the 1953 film also does, which is pretty astonishing that not just the film itself references the original film, but the poster references the original poster as well. They directly mirror each other, which is pretty cool. Although it's worth pointing out that the 2005 poster is actually seemingly based more on the 1988 TV series sequel to the 1953 film that evolved the giant alien hand marketing concept to specifically be giant alien hand clutching the earth. 
There's also some interesting details about the effort the 1953 film went to in order to increase its faithfulness to the source material that you can watch by clicking this video here.